Good morning, everyone. I thank the lady and the pianist. That was magnificent, wasn't it? All week we've been looking at in our seminars how to give the body the right conditions for optimum health. Because we're living in a body that has the ability to age, and we know it does age, but unfortunately most bodies are ageing too young, far too young. And all week we've been looking at how you can slow that process down. That is good news. But what I'm going to show you today, how your brain need never deteriorate. God never meant the brain to deteriorate. Yes, the body will deteriorate, but you can slow that down. But the brain need never deteriorate. Isn't that wonderful news? It's wonderful news because it means everyone in this room, their brains need never deteriorate. But it's very sad news because we, so know, we know so many people whose brains are deteriorating. Is that right? The current figures in Australia are 1,700 cases of dementia are being diagnosed every week. Scary, isn't it? Dementia just doesn't happen overnight. Dementia, Alzheimer's, is often the result of many little threads happening little by little over many years. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to begin by showing you a very brief look at the brain. The brain is the capital city of the body. It is the headquarters. And everything that happens in the body affects the mind. And everything that happens in the mind affects the body. So let's have a look at headquarters. Now looking from side on, headquarters basically looks like this. And looking from the top down, headquarters looks like this. Now notice there are two lobes in the front part of the brain. And medicine calls these two lobes the frontal lobe. Now even though there are two lobes, they're referred to as if there is just one lobe because both of these lobes have the same function. It is in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our intellect is. So you can see that's a pretty important part of the brain. It's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our reasoning powers reside. In the frontal lobe part of the brain is where judgment takes place. And it's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where we make our decisions. Now this third function of the frontal lobe I call the most wonderful gift that God gave to mankind. You see, the will is the governing power in the nature of man. It is the power of decision or of choice. And when you think about it, everything depends on the right action of the will. There's a beautiful little book called Steps to Christ, and it explains it very nice. This author says in there, you, it says, you cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then come in and he'll work with you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Thus, through the right action of the will, an entire change can be made in the life. Science is now showing us that we can be rewiring our brain right up until the day we die. That's amazing, isn't it? You know the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Wrong. You can. <laughs> the will is not a muscle, but it is just like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. You see, the mind and the nerves gain tone and strength through the exercise of the will. It's a fascinating thing, the will. I raised eight children. And what worked with one didn't work with another. But you know what I noticed? When you had the will of the child... You could turn your back and you know that what that child had decided would happen. It's a wonderful thing working with the will. The will shouldn't be beaten to pieces. And the will should not be allowed to go wherever it wants. Have you ever tried to grow a vine around a pole? I'm growing one at the moment. And I would say one in a hundred go around the pole. <laughs> the rest go all over the place. And every... Well, it hasn't been lately, but maybe every few weeks I might pull the tendrils around the pole. And I'll come back in a few days and it's gone away again. So I come and I gently pull it back. Now, if I force it, I will break the tendril. 
But if every day I gently guide and direct that tendril, I can get it around the pole. The will should be gently guided and directed. Remember that. Not beaten to pieces and not allowed to go wherever it wants. Now in the human brain, the frontal lobe takes up between 33 and 38% of the brain. So that's basically the front third of the brain is frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe does not fully develop until the, page, until the age of 30. And you look traditionally, in a lot of cultures, young men were not given positions of responsibility until they'd reached 30. Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30. I remember my son Peter once at the age of 25, I, he did something silly. I said, what are you doing, Peter? He said, Mom, my frontal lobe's not fully developed. <laughs> I said, yes, that's why you need your mother. <laughs> and I say to parents, bind your children to your heart here. Bind them to your heart here. And you don't bind them to, you, to your heart by taking them to dream world or do you have those sorts of things here? <laughs> No, no. Do you know how to bind them to your heart? You listen to them. You work with them. You encourage them. Never should the child be praised. Never should their action be praised. Well, what do you do? I read this in a book and it surprised me. Next page, the author said, the child needs encouragement, gratitude and appreciation. Got that? <laughs> That's what the child is. The child did a job well done. One thing can be said, you're a fantastic kid. Wow, look what you've done. Or another th thing can be said, you did that so well. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you've done. Now, we're all children. We're all human beings. Can you for a moment experience the different emotions with those two things? Mm-hmm. And when a child's constantly told that they're fantastic, they eventually think they're written a bit. Hmm? <laughs> children are precious, we are all precious and children need gratitude, they need encouragement and they need appreciation and that sort of treatment brings out the best. Why is there a difference? Well in homes where children are brought up with the hedge of safety around the home, the frontal lobe strengthens. What's the hedge of safety? It is discipline. It's actually limits. And children feel very comfortable when they, can, they know they can go here, but they can't go here. And when you tell a child they cannot go off the edge of this area here, what's the first thing they do? Toe goes off first. Nothing happens, a bit more goes <laughs> off. Parent says, don't go off there. Don't, I told you not to go off there. Do you know what this parent is teaching the child? They're teaching the child to lie. They're an unfaithful parent. Now, if the parent says, if you go off that, that, uh, that edge there, you won't be able to uh, go to the beach this afternoon. Uh, you won't be able to um, have the iPad for half an hour tonight. Uh, you won't be able to, uh, you know, whatever. Or some parents say, if you go off, you're going to get a smack. Now, I don't believe in beating the living daylights out of children, but I also don't think that it's good for a child or healthy for a child or produces strong adults if they're allowed to go whatever they want. So a consequence. Now if the consequence is painful, I can assure you they won't do it again. It's like if a child touches the fire, I promise you they won't touch the fire again. Now some children learn by you saying, careful of the fire sweetheart, it will burn. Have you noticed? Some will nod and won't touch the fire, but some have to touch the fire, don't they? And if my child touched the fire and was crying and I say, oh, you poor darling, you must have a sore finger, but that's what happens. <laughs> that's what happens. Come here, I'll put some aloe vera on it, but that's what happens. I have a friend in Fiji. She says, the whites don't understand us Fijians. When our children fall off a bike, we laugh. <laughs> and while we're laughing, we pick them off and dust them off. Do you know, it's fantastic. What's the old saying? If we weren't laughing, we'd be crying. Laughter is very good medicine. There's even a proverb, I think it's Proverbs 22, 17, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, and a broken spirit dries up the bones. So if you want an intelligent child, what do you do? You put limits, 
and there are consequences for every action. And so if the child goes off, wants to go off here, and last time it hurt, they will hesitate to go off again. You see, it's in the frontal lobe part of the brain where our self-control is, and that's the best thing you can teach a child. In the frontal lobe part of the brain is foresight. In the frontal lobe part of the brain is where our organisational skills, very important part of the brain. In fact, one writer called it the crown of the brain. But what makes it more important than any other part of the brain is that is where God communicates with mankind. The Bible says in Isaiah 1.18, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. This is where God reasons with human beings. How important it is to strengthen that. I've met some 20-year-olds and you would think it was fully developed. I've met some 40-year-olds and I wonder if it will ever develop. <laughs> In a monkey, frontal lobe takes up 17% of the brain. In a dog, 7.5%. In a cat... Any guesses? Three. One lady said, not my cat. <laughs> Can you see that the Bible is correct and we know it is correct? In Genesis it says, Genesis 1.26, that God created man in his image. In the image of God he created man. Man and female created he them. After the image of God. This is just not the eyes and the nose and the limbs and the body. It is also the brain. It is the frontal lobe of the brain is where God communicates with man and sets man far higher than any other creature. So can you see that the enemy of souls, what part of the brain would he like to take down? The frontal lobe. So what I want to quickly go through with you is some of the things that take it down. I'm so thankful for the lady who took the children's session because number one in taking down the frontal lobe is sugar. Not the sugar cane. The pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. It is closely, as closely related to the sugarcane as heroin is to the poppy plant. And it is far more dangerous, I believe, because most people don't realize its danger. We've got a book by a Dr. Yutkin in our health center, and the book's called Pure, White and Deadly. And one of the chapters, he claims that sugar should be banned. It is so dangerous. What does it do? It causes blood sugar levels to rise dramatically. This is when the kids are bouncing off the walls. Very quickly, insulin's released to get the blood glucose levels down again. But because there was so much glucose, too much insulin's released, where are we now? Too low. This is when the kids are bouncing off the wall. This is when they're scrapping and fighting and being disobedient, won't do anything you say. People used to say to me, how can you stand having your children around you all day? Because I homeschooled my six children. I said, it's easy when you don't use sugar and you use the will. Easy parenting. I have met some people that have had heartache as children from parents, from a mother particularly in this case that lived on sugar. Sometimes everything was fine. Other times he'd pick an apple out of the fruit bowl and he'd get a belting. Parents are no fun <laughs> when they're doing this. Kids are no fun when they're doing this. Do you know what God our, meant our fuel to give us? This. A nice, steady, consistent delivery of fuel. And the reason for that is... Our brain cells are consuming 15 times the fuel of any other cell and our brains can only hold a two-minute supply of fuel. And that's why blood glucose levels go up, insulin brings it down. Once it's down, how long does it take before intellect, reason, judgment and will are not working? Two minutes. Lights are on, but no one's home. And as we looked at through the week, the hybridised wheat gets the blood sugar level up even higher than sugar. It was hybridized in the 50s, went worldwide in the 70s. If you'd like to pursue that a little bit more, there's a book called Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis, and you can get my DVDs which pursue that one. Caffeine, surely not. 
How many Aussies, New Zealanders, woke up to these three this morning? Let me show you what caffeine does to the brain. Here is the nerve cell, and we have one trillion of these in our brain. And what I'm drawing now is the receptor sites. They're like the dendrites. And what they do is they bring in the messages and then they're sent down this arm. This is the axon. There are little filaments at the end. These are the boutons. And then the messages come out and they connect with the next nerve cell. Sometimes these messages can be coming through at 200 kilometres an hour. So the messages come in, they're encapsulated, they're sent down the arm into the little boutons and then they're released to the next nerve cell. What caffeine does is it interferes with those neurotransmitters. One is adenosine, and adenosine is a neurotransmitter that acts like a fuse box, or you could also call it the brakes. And when caffeine goes in, adenosine levels drop. That means brakes are failing, fuse box gone. Brain says, we've got a problem. Quickly, develop extra receptor sites so that every bit of adenosine that comes through can be grabbed. And then the person comes to our health retreat, Misty Mountain Health Retreat. We don't serve any caffeine. Adenosine levels go back to normal. Oh, do they suffer. People say to me, do you drink coffee, Barbara? I say, no, I just watch the people suffer. Day one, Misty Mountain Health Retreat. Do you know they suffer more than the heroin addict, than the methadone addict, than the ice addict, than the smoker, than the alcoholic? Whoa. Why does it have such a strong effect? Well, when a cup of coffee is taken, or a Red Bull, or a whole block of chocolate, or a Pepsi, or a Coke, it's almost like we've met a tiger in the, on the path, and an adrenaline response happens. Adenosine levels drop, acetylcholine levels rise. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that has to do with frontal lobe function. So when a person has a cup of coffee, Intellect, reason and judgment and will rise. How many people say, oh, I love my coffee, just gets my brain going in the morning? No wonder you've met a tiger on the path. Can you see why acetylcholine levels rise? Because when you meet a tiger on the path, you're going to have to make some quick decisions. You're going to have to use your intellect, reason, judgment. Are you going to be able to climb that tree or you can outrun him or can you get a block of uh, wood or something and knock him on the head? Quick decisions have to be made. No wonder this rises. The other neurotransmitter is dopamine. And dopamine is the pursuit of happiness or the pursuit of reward or the pursuit of escape hormone. It rises. No wonder you've met a tiger on the path. You, you're going to have to move. <laughs> Superhuman feats under a crisis. I'm sure we've all heard of them. Do you know that happens every time someone has a cup of coffee or a block of chocolate or a Red Bull, etc., etc.? Did you know children are admitted to hospital every year, every Easter, with chocolate poisoning? And that bit doesn't meet the... It doesn't get into the newspapers, does it? And you know why it doesn't get into the newspapers? Because what are the journalists and the editors drinking and eating? Mm -hmm. We've got a book at home called... Caffeine blues, and the author said he found a lot of had trouble getting the research because the researchers are drinking coffee. One lady said, Oh, it just gets me going in the morning, gets my brain going, gets me up and going. I said, That's right, you've met a tiger on the path. But you know what happens? There's this compensatory effect. The most amazing thing about the body, especially the brain, is its ability to adapt and adjust. And it does adapt and adjust. Very quickly, the brain says, we've got an imbalance here. Stop making so much acetylcholine. Eventually, dopamine levels are exhausted. When the receptor sites get flooded because of the change, there's the pain. Depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain. The most responsible for a chemical imbalance in the brain is caffeine. I used to work as a psychiatric nurse. What do they drink all day? Well, how come they can drink coffee all day if it does this? Well, guess who also is drinking coffee all day? The nurses 
and the psychiatrist and the psychologist. Well, how come they don't have mental illness? You would be surprised. <laughs> you would be very surprised. I'm showing you what causes an imbalance and a compromise of this frontal lobe. Mercury. Neurotoxin, no safe dose of mercury, was banned in America for 300 years before some dentists from Europe came over to America, started their own association, the American Dental Association, and they legalised mercury. Why do dentists love mercury? It's the only liquid metal and it's put with other metals and it goes into your mouth and it basically moles and sits there. And it's antiseptic, well, it's antiseptic, all right, it's anti-life. Now, what mercury does when it hits the bacteria in your mouth, it converts it to methylated mercury. Now it can get through the blood-brain barrier. Now it can get through the placenta barrier. And it starts to chomp holes in the myelin sheath. And when that myelin sheath is three-quarters gone, there's your multiple sclerosis. What also is causing a compromise of the frontal lobe is alcohol. Alcohol and mercury, they're the, core, the two, we'll call them NT, neurotoxins. Both of these kill brain cells. Now, this brain cell is unique. Once it's dead, it's gone. Did you hear that? The brain cells we have now, we have for life, and we've got to look after them. And this list here, little by little, is causing a compromise and these two particularly are killing it. There is no safe dose of mercury. There is no safe dose of alcohol. They're both neurotoxins. Tobacco, tobacco greatly inhibits fuel to the brain by clogging up the arteries. MSG, monosodium glutinate, causes the nerve cells to over... Fire. When they overfire, they get exhausted and can die. Chemicals. It's a very socially acceptable list, isn't it? Drugs. We had a doctor do our program and she said, I've been a doctor for 40 years and I can tell you that in the medical journals it states that antidepressants cause depression. And there are many drugs that have depression as a side effect. Drugs do not cause... They do not cure disease. They just change the form and location of disease. If a guest comes to me, to our health retreat, who's on 10 different medications, I have a quick look and I say, if you choose, because only you have the authority, you could stop that one, you could stop that one, that one we're going to have to ease off. So if a person's on medication, they need advice on what to implement. But once I find you give the body the right conditions, it starts to get stronger, work better, the medication can be eased off. Very socially acceptable list. And yet little by little, like the dripping tap on a stone, it is eating away at frontal lobe function. No need for me to talk about the dangers of ice, cyanide, arsenic. That's very obvious, but many people are unaware of the dangers of these very socially acceptable things. It's very easy to live well and eat well without sugar because there are so many sweeteners that aren't as dangerous as sugar. There's maple syrup, there's honey, there's palm sugars. None of those will cause diabetes or contribute greatly to diabetes. And they're, as the lady said, the teacher said, they're complex sugars. They don't have as dangerous effect. But how can we rewire our brain? Well, one of the first things you have to do is stop that list. Because when that list is eaten, frontal lobe is compromised, then we lose our ability to make proper decisions. And the laws that govern the mind, when adhered to, bring mental function to its peak. The first law of the mind is cause and effect. Effect follows cause with unvarying degree all through nature. So even with mental illness, there is always a cause. There are causes for depression. Dr. Neil Nedley, you may be familiar with him, he's written a book called Depression, A Way Out. Remarkable book. Every chapter starts with someone's story. And he said 
that when he started to implement lifestyle changes in his depressed patients, he thought, if I can just equal what medication does, he said, I'll be happy. And I'll never forget his words. He said, far exceeded. <laughs> so when these depressed people became hydrated, started eating wholesome food, started exercising, started going to bed early, all the things we've been looking at all week far exceeded what medication does. Isn't that exciting? I've met six people in my travels who are bipolar, schizophrenia, and they're medication-free and working well. As a psychiatric nurse many years ago now, I would not have thought that could ever be possible. 1% of psychiatrists today treat mental illness with lifestyle nutrition. Not many, but it's good to know that they are there. So it's of a particular interest to me. As a Christian, I was not a Christian when I worked as a psychiatric nurse, I made the decision to give my heart to God at the age of 25. It was the best decision of my life. And then God led me into a path of how to treat mental illness without drugs. And one of the most important ways, not only is to keep the things out, I just drew to you, but also the way we think. The way we think can bring us down. The way we think can bring us up. And that's the most beautiful thing about rewiring the brain. Brings us to the second law. It's a choice. Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do this, you will lose much. Page 147 of Christ Objects Lesson. Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. And we are all tempted with that, aren't we? <laughs> now, when we struggled with, when we struggled with uh, depressive or um, negative thoughts, we have a choice. And most people re don't realise you have a choice. Now, it's very difficult to use that choice if frontal lobe is compromised because of the things that I described. Very difficult to use your frontal lobe to make the right choices if you're dehydrated, if you're not eating nourishing food, if you're overloaded with sugar, if you've had late nights, if you haven't exercised. Can you see where the eight laws come in? Page 127 of the Ministry of Healing. The writer says, pure air. Abstemiousness, sunlight, uh, exercise, rest, proper diet, use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. So you've got to get those laws in place first. We've been looking at them in the seminars this week. So we do have a choice. We not only have a choice on what we say, but we have a choice on how we think. And many people have well-grooved pathways <laughs> that need to be changed. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, she explains it very well. She says, when a thought comes into our brain, it is like a breeze. Now, the nerve cells, let's draw a nerve cell here. The nerve cell with all of those receiving stations looks like a tree. So here's the base of the tree or the basis, and here are the receiving stations. It looks like the branches of a tree. And when a thought comes through, it's like a breeze wafting through the trees. And we have a choice. We can hold on to that thought or we can let it go. Now, if we hold on to it and it's a negative thought, you're an idiot, you're hopeless, I'm sure we're all challenged with that, a thorn will grow. Science shows this now, that when we hold on, in fact, two words describe it well, when we cherish or entertain, what's cherish? Love. What's entertain? Please come in. Actually, stay the night. Actually, stay the week. Entertain. When we cherish or entertain negative thoughts, a thorn grows. And then we continue what, in fact, you could almost put, call it a little nest, <laughs> And they, those thorns damage the nerve cells. There's your psychosomatic diseases. So at every point, we have a choice. We can hold it or we can let it go. It's a choice. 
Most people don't realise. I have helped many people who get panic attacks. And I find many people are in the habit of panicking. It sounds like a simple thing. In fact, some may be very offended at me saying that. Usually the first panic is granted. It's like the girl that came to our program. She was really in the, pa- in the habit of panicking. She was only 30. I said, when did it all start? She said, well, a guy at work was diddling the books. I blew the whistle on him and I got a brick through my front window that night. Whoa, what would that do? Strong pathway. See that? Strong pathway. So next time this girl goes through a stressful situation, where are her feelings going to automatically go? Down the strong pathway. Have you ever been on a bushwalk? you got a nice pathway. Amelia and I climbed, he's at Mount Victoria. And we didn't want to go around the long way and we saw a well-worn pathway. Not really well-worn, but obviously the very fit ones. <laughs> Halfway up, we wondered if we'd taken the right pathway. But we just kept stopping and looking at the view. It was a pathway because many had been there before us. It's hard going through the bush if you can't walk on the pathway, isn't it? Do you know, we as human beings go down the path of least resistance, don't we? (laughs) So this girl, unbeknownst, because of the panic, it had a profound effect on her. That makes a strong pathway. And every time she had a stressful situation, down she'd go, down she'd go, down she'd go. She eventually went to a psychiatrist. He said, I found the cause of all your problems. You get panic attacks. What did that do to the pathway? Oh, put a bit of Rio in it. He made another pathway. He said, you'll be on panic attack medication for the rest of your life. Her mother said, what did the doctor say? He said, I I get panic attacks. More pathway. He said, I'll be on medication for the rest of my life. Can you see what's happening? The more you go down those pathways, the more you cement them in, concrete them in. She came to our health retreat. I said, I think you're panicking about your panic attacks. She smiled. What did the smile say? I think you're right. You see, the back part of our brain is the feeling part of the brain. And the back part of our brain is a bad boss. It doesn't mean feelings are bad. Of course, feelings aren't bad, but they're not a good boss. The front part of the brain is a very good boss because every decision this part of the brain makes is made according to intellect, reason and judgment. You see that? And when feelings and thoughts come up, they thread through the frontal lobe. And at that point, frontal lobe can go, no, don't say that. Or frontal lobe might say, that's good. That's your board of senses. That's your board of critiques. Can you see what God meant for human beings? That their frontal lobe be under the control of God. Early every morning, I pray and I give my frontal lobe to God. Because he gave us choice. God is not in every man. You would never say God was in Hitler, Stalin. No, no, no. God gave mankind choice. And one man said, who did our program, he said, well, if I was the guy up top, I'd come with a machine gun and mow them all down. And his wife laughed and said, what good would that do? Then the Knox crop had come up. Isn't that true? No, it's a hard problem. And if God does come in and mow them all down with a machine gun, he has now taken away what? Choice. It's a powerful thing to give us choice. And God never forces. But there's a verse in the Bible that says, Behold, the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeing whom he can devour. And then the Bible says, Whom resist? Steadfast in the faith. When we have the faith of Jesus that we have developed through a knowledge of him, we have the strength to do it. But let's look at Revelation 3.19. It's a beautiful picture of God. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Beautiful illustration of the intimacy with which God wants to know human beings through their frontal lobe. God prompts us through our frontal lobe. The devil tempts us through our feelings. One lady said, I've got two voices in my brain. I said, we all have. <laughs> it's the feeling part. And then God. Every morning we get it. We wake up. It's very early. Frontal lobe says, 
Give your heart to God. Have a big drink of water. Go and walk. Feeling says, oh, I'll just sleep a little longer. (laughs) Off to sleep. Oh, no, look at the time. No time to pray. No time to walk. No. Can you see that? The only way to do it is to go to bed early. That's the only way to do it. You've got to start today to plan for tomorrow. I said to this girl, I think you're panicking about your panic attack. She smiled. She knew she was, but she didn't know what to do. Every time a panic happened, well down the last, the path of least resistance, she did not know what to do. I said, you know, at that point you have a choice. And what helps the choice if you drink a big glass of water, if you go and run around the house three times, do push-ups, do some physical, have a cold shower. <laughs> you just got to get over that peak. I gave birth to six babies. I had all natural births. And yes, it's tough, but you also know that soon it's going to (laughs) ease. And then you'll have 30 seconds to prepare for the next contraction. But it comes to a peak, and then it eases. So you can handle it. You can handle it. I love coaching women through childbirth. It's a wonderful thing to have a natural childbirth and and be awake to, to see that beautiful new baby. I have to tell you that they thought I had a long time once and they all left me and the baby came and I just had to deliver that baby myself. And it was just the most amazing experience. I'm glad it was my fifth child, so I knew a little bit about it by then. (laughs) But I thought, whoa, you know, why why can't women be educated so they can deliver their own babies? But we're not going to go there right now. That's another subject. (laughs) We'll do it in the women's meetings. So you have a choice. At that point, you have a choice. It's difficult, especially if you've got a well-worn pathway. But if that point, you make a decision, I'm not going down there. Your whole body's screaming at you to go down there. Just ignore it. Remember? Your feelings are like a wild horse. They need the bridle on them. Whoa up, whoa up. They need the bridle. There's a psalm that talks about this. It's Psalm... 39, and it says, I will take heed to my ways. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. (laughs) And the other psalm is Psalm 16 verse, sorry, 17 verse 6. And the Bible says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. Here are the reins. This is the bridle. Keep it strong, keep it hydrated, keep it slapped, nourished, exercised. Don't let any of the stimulants compromise it. And then you will have the ability to say, no, I'm not listening to this wild horse. I'm going to pull him in. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. But you know, anything in life that we put effort in, we get the results, don't we? And it's just like the lady that played the piano. Both women who've played the piano are amazing. And I'm sure they didn't start yesterday. Mm -hmm. Probably many years ago. And if you first start playing the piano, it's very difficult. But you go at it and you at it. It's exactly the same with rewiring your brain. And the ladies that played the piano, they've got some strong pathways in their brain. I was watching the first lady. She wasn't even looking at the music. (laughs) Wow. She's got some strong pathways. I understand the second lady had to look at the music because that was a difficult piece. (laughs) But you know what I mean. It takes effort. Little by little by little. So I said to this lady, become well hydrated, run around the block. Now the first time she conquered her panic attack, how did she feel? Like a mighty conqueror. Second time, it's a bit easier. How long will it take before her conquering panic attack pathway is stronger than her panic attack pathway. 21 days of not going down the panic attack pathway, 21 days of going down the new conquering the panic attack pathway, and now she's in the habit of not panicking. Can you see that? 21 days, research shows. 21 days of visiting the new, not visiting the old, and the old one fades out. Isn't that good? It's like if you're on a bushwalk. 21 days of going on a new pathway. 21 days of not on the old pathway. The weeds start to grow. The leaves start to go down, and your new pathway is stronger. 
Remember what science said? We have the ability to rewire our brain right up until the day we die. If you have some habits you don't like and you want to change, where there's a will, there's a way. If you say you can, you will. If you say you can't, you're right. You won't. <laughs> and someone might say, I don't want to do that. Can't do much with them. But if someone says, I don't really want to, but I'm going to give it a go. Ah, we can, tr we, can, we can work with that. We can work with that. I know in some homes, children are not allowed to say, I can't. It's like the little one trying to carry a heavy bucket. I can't, I can't. You know, they really act. You know that. I can't. I saw my daughter do it with her little one one day. She said, we'll do three steps with this hand and then three steps with that hand. But the parent that comes in and says, let me do it, sweetheart, that parent has just said, you're hopeless. Hmm? You're hopeless. Show the child how to do it. Let's get two buckets. Let me... You've done that well. Thank you so much. I appreciate so much you've carried those buckets. Can you see that? Practice makes perfect without parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. Got that? <laughs> We've got so many tradesmen that will not apprentice young people anymore because they've grown up in homes where they've never worked, they've never had to do a thing. Whose fault's that? It's not genetics. <laughs> Love is a choice and forgiveness is a choice. Many people have mental illness through guilt. Many people have mental illness because they're harboring anger and resentment over terrible things that happen to them. Every heart has its sorrow. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. We had a lady at our health retreat who was 57. This is about 10 years ago now. And if you wanted to know where she was, you followed the laughter. She laughed all the time. And when I heard her story, I was shocked. She lost every single member of her family in the Holocaust. She has no living relatives anymore. Her mother, her father, her brothers, her sisters, her cousins, her grandmothers, all were killed in Poland in the Holocaust. And what did this lady do all day? Laugh. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> and you know what? Midweek, her daughters came and visited her. They loved her so much. It's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. And forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that has the power to break the chemical bonds of hostility, anger, and hate. One lady said they don't deserve to be forgiven. I said, you're absolutely right, but it's got nothing to do with it. Forgiveness will give you wings. It'll give you freedom. And Dr. Carolyn Leaf said, in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, she shows something amazing about forgiveness. She says, when you forgive, now I'm about to introduce a principle that might sound very flippant, but it's actually scientific fact. Fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. Like the lady who a woman had hurt her badly. The woman's name was Monica. She couldn't forgive her. She was hurting so much because this woman had been so cruel to her. But she knew she had to forgive because it was eating her up. She couldn't stop thinking about it. I'm going to wring her neck. <laughs> I'm going to put sugar in a petrol tank. You see all this? It was just eating her up. So she said, Father in heaven, I forgive her. She couldn't say her name. No wonder she'd been badly hurt. Don't go to feelings, they'll tell you never to do it. It's a frontal lobe decision. Next day, I forgive her. Next day, I forgive her. Next day, I forgive her. Sixth day, I forgive Monica. Can you see what's happening? But at first, what did she have to do? She had to fake it. What are you faking? Your feelings. They're wild horses. Don't refer to them. Mm-hmm. Just do it. Do it because you've got to. It's a not negotiable subject. This lady told me that th two months later she saw Monica in the shops. Now, she didn't feel like running up and hugging her and kissing her, and she doesn't have to. But when she passed the woman, she smiled. She could not have done that two months ago. She smiled. You see, your words, 
affect your feelings. And remember, your feelings are the wild horse, and you've got to bring them under control. That's how God meant it to be. God meant your feelings to be under the control of frontal lobe. She smiled at the woman and kept walking. The woman had been very cruel to her. It doesn't mean you have to make her a best friend. The woman could hardly bear being smiled at. (laughs) One lady said, I don't want to free that person. I said, you can't. You can only free yourself. It's a decision. So when this lady says, I forgive her, she made a little pathway. Every day she made that pathway. And what's happening after a while? She's got the forgiveness pathway. And her feelings are coming into line. It is true that our words reveal our feelings. And that is the fourth law. But it is also true that your words affect your feelings. Forgiveness is not negotiable. And Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she says that in the brain there are glial cells and glial cells are the vacuum cleaners. The smallest cell in the human body is the sperm cell. The second smallest cell is the glial cells. Let's say we all forgive everyone who's ever hurt us. If if you're wondering if there's anyone you should forgive, I can tell you right now God's very faithful. He'll bring them straight to your mind. (laughs) Maybe they just popped in. Remember, you don't have to feel like it. Just do it. No wonder you don't feel like it. Especially when there's been very severe cases of sexual and physical abuse. Just forgive. Just do it. When you go to sleep tonight, and as you heard this week, we're going to try and be asleep by 10. When you go to sleep tonight, because you've chosen to forgive, these little cells are activated and they come along and they vacuum clean the thorns up. Medicine now shows that forgiveness has a physiological effect on the brain to clean it up. And what does the Lord's Prayer say? Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Got that? So if there's anyone in your life you're not forgiving, God cannot forgive you. People don't think that when they say it, do they? Love is a choice. The movies are wrong. I hope I haven't disappointed you. They must be wrong when 70% of marriages fall apart. Love is a choice and love should be made here. The choice to love is a frontal lobe activity. I'll tell you a story. My husband, Michael, had been a single man for three years. I knew Michael. We'd known each other for 10 years. But Michael said his first wife fell away because he knew it was a feeling decision. And he'd been a single father with little children, and he knew his children needed a mother, and he knew he needed a wife. So he decided to choose his wife scientifically. (laughs) He said, I'm a businessman. He said... If you make a list and you adhere to the list in your business decision at work. So he said, I'm going to do this with marriage. So everybody that Michael knew, he put on the list. And his mate said, get one of the young therapists, because Michael was 39 at the time and they were about 25. And he said, okay. And he said to his mate, doesn't work out on the list. (laughs) He said, one name kept going to the top of the list. And unbeknownst to me, because no one knew about the list, it was me. He said, I had two negatives against my name. One, I had six children. Who's going to take on six children? You know, it's a big, big job. But he said, when he got to know the children, they were really good workers, so they went to the positive side. <laughs> he said, the other negative I had was that I was older than him by, I think, three and a half years. And he'd never considered anyone older than him, but he thought... I'm nearly 40, what does it matter? So that went to the positive side. So he said to his daughter one morning, because his children knew about it, I think his daughter was 11 and his son was 12. And apparently they thought I was a good choice because I cooked good food. (laughs) (laughs) Because sometimes I'd feel sorry for them and bring them some food. (laughs) Because Michael can cook toast, that's about it. (laughs) 
So Michael got up one day and said, today's the day I will ask Mrs. Russ to marry me. And his daughter said, Dad, you have to ask her out first. He said, there's going to be nothing emotional about this decision. <laughs> but his, his daughter wore him down and so I got a call. Would you like to go out for tea tonight? I said, yes. No hesitation because I very much liked Mr O'Neill. I just thought, can't get near him with a 10-foot pole. What a pity, nice guy. So when he asked me out, I'm totally puzzled because he doesn't do that. We had a nice evening. When he dropped me off, he shook my hand. <laughs> Three days later, he said to his daughter, the courtship's gone on long enough. <laughs> Today's the day I will ask Mrs Russ to marry me. Anyway, in the afternoon, he comes into my house. He said, um, I've got a few things I need to talk to you about. I said, yes. He said, um, I've been thinking about things and I think we should get married. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I said, this, this is very analytical. He said, I'm a very analytical person. I said, well, I think when two people marry, they should love each other. And when I said that, he went, hmm. He said, well, I'm very attracted to you and I love your character. And I thought, whoa. Mr O'Neill feels that about me? I certainly feel that about him. So I said, all right, I will. <laughs> Just like that. It seems like a very flippant answer to a life-changing question. But I very much liked Michael. I very much respected him. He was the boss at Living Valley Springs where I worked. And so my thought was, he wants to marry me? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds good. So he said, great, meet me tonight at my house with all the kids. <laughs> now the ages of the children were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 19, 21. Mine 10, he's 11, mine 12, he's 13, all the rest mine. So we sat in a half circle, four boys, four girls, and Michael said, well, we have an announcement to make, and his children said, Dad, we already know. <laughs> he said, oh, in fact, everyone on the property knew except for me. <laughs> no wonder my children were being silly and giggling all day. They all knew but me. Anyway, he said, well, what do you all think? And he asked every child and they all agreed. Now, that was a miracle because, as you probably know, boys are very protective of their mothers. My little boys were like my knights in shining armour. In fact, I remember one guy was interested in me and my little boy didn't like him and he came and stood in front of him one day and said, if you marry my mum, I'm not going to be the flower boy. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're very protective, but I think Michael showed them great respect by not coming near me, by not touching me. So it was all done basically analytical because when you fall in love, you fall in love with character. That's why when he said, I love your character, I thought, wow, I certainly like his. And he said, I'm very attracted to you. And I thought, well, I'm very attracted to this guy. But you don't run with every attraction. There's your wild horse. <laughs> it's got to come under the guide of the frontal lobe. Now, the next day, Michael walked past the window and my heart began to beat. And I thought, oh, dear. Then I realised, oh, I'm marrying him. It's all right. <laughs> See, your words affect your feelings. I didn't say to my heart, okay, heart, love that man. No, no, no. Your words affect your feelings without you even realising that. And because I was going to marry that man, there was no need to put the brakes on anymore. I could just let my heart go to this man. And I very much love this man. It's 18 years later now. And I'll tell you a little illustration that shows you why I love this man so much. Because most people don't know what love is. Let's say it was about three months ago. We're in Sydney. I'm doing evening meetings. Michael always drives the car. We live in a rainforest. I've never, ever taken my key out of the car. I've never even locked my house. That's where we live. So I'm not used to locking cars. He had to go to some business. So I was driving myself to the meetings this night. He was going to meet me later. He said, don't forget my computer. Well, I came out and the car's locked and it was only a little key. So I didn't think you could push button it open. So I put the computer by the door, went around and opened the door, went back in, got all the other things, put it in the car, shut the door, backing out and I went boom. <laughs> 
And I thought, what's that? I couldn't see anything I could have bumped into. So it's rolling back a little and I stopped it to check it out. And I looked ahead and there on the cement is Michael's computer case with the handle just sort of hanging off like that. At that point, Michael rings. Hi. He said, how are you going? I said, all right. He said, what's the matter? I said, I just ran over your computer. <laughs> Silence on the other end of the phone. He said, oh. I said, well, I've got to go. I'm backing out of the, out of the driveway. Now, what am I challenged with right then and there? What am I feeling saying, you idiot? What? Do, 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 do. Aren't we all challenged? I've got a choice right then and there. Frontal lobe's working well. I was given it all the right conditions. Frontal lobe says, oh, look, settle down. No wonder, you know, you didn't know the key. It was dusk. You know, Michael, you know, can you see reason, intellect and judgment? You're about to give a two-hour meeting. And you don't want this to trump this. <laughs> Put it out. So I effectively did. <laughs> it was a mistake. Don't we all make mistakes? <laughs> That's why we always should be tender with other mistakes. I'm driving along, having a bit of a struggle, but I, I feel I'm on top. <laughs> I get a call. It's Michael. Hello? It's all right. This is Michael. It's all right. Thank you. <laughs> Why do I love that man? <laughs> uh-huh. What is love? <laughs> love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemingly. Seeketh not its own. Rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. Believeth all things, beareth all things, endureth all things, hopeth all things. Love never fails. Isn't that true, love? Shouldn't that be said at every wedding? Shouldn't that be gone over six months before the wedding? And if someone says to me, what's one word that will describe marriage? I'd say serve. Service. Yeah? People get annoyed at me because I wash Michael's clothes. I... I cook his dinner, I cook his meal, I iron his shirts, I have everything ready. They say, Barbara, let him do it. I said, I want for nothing. <laughs> I have a man who's never raised his voice to me. He's never got angry with me, even when I run over his computer. Ah, oh, you see that? Do you think his feelings were challenging him? Oh, yes. But you know, there's a wonderful power in silence. Notice his reaction? Silence. <laughs> oh, how important that this be strong. Huh? Oh, how many words have been said that should never have been said. Hmm? But I'm upset. We'll go for a run. I'm upset. Have a cold shower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have 10 glasses of water. 10 glasses of water? Better than losing it. Better than a mother, run round, the, run round the block three times in a 90 than lose it with the kids at the breakfast table. Got that? <clears throat> the policeman might knock on the door to find out what's happening. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. Your words reveal your feelings and you cannot let them all out. Proverbs 29, 11 says, The fool utters all his mind. But the wise man keeps it until afterwards. Colossians 4 verse 6 states, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. It takes work. Number five is the law of adaptation. It's called neuroplasticity. Have you heard of it? In fact, 10 years ago, medicine thought we had a hard-wired brain, but they now acknowledge we have a soft-wired brain because of the law of adaptation. There are two proverbs that show this, so the Bible was talking about it thousands of years ago. One is Proverbs 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed because of the law of adaptation. 
The other proverb is Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man. With a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare for thy soul. Because of the law of adaptation. Now, because of the law of adaptation, our brain has the ability to grow and our brain has the ability to shrink. A terrible growing scenario is when people cherish and entertain negativity. And what's growing, students? Thorns. Lots of thorns. <laughs> damaging the tissues, damaging the bodies. I know that your frontal lobes are working very well not right now because you're probably very, very hot. <laughs> Congratulations. Soon we will be finished and you can get some water and have some fresh air because it's particularly hot. And I do understand you haven't got fans here because this doesn't usually happen, yeah? So that's the terrible growing scenario. If you've been through heartache, and I'd like to suggest we all have, stop relating it. Stop going on and on about it because you know what's going to happen to it? It's going to grow and who would want that? And the thorns grow. What's a wonderful growing scenario? Every time we learn something new, we, learn another, we develop another dendrite. My husband learnt to fly the helicopter six months ago, sorry, six years ago, and it was a manual and five different things at once. Left foot, right foot, left hand and right hand are doing two things all at once. And his teacher said to him, I'm warning you, you're in your 50s, it's going to take a while. Do you know Michael mastered it in the same time that the 20-year-olds master it? Has he ever had a 50-year-old who's not drinking alcohol, who's not smoking, who's not having coffee, who's going to bed early, who's well hydrated, who's well exercised? There is a formula. And if you abide by the formula, you will get the results. Michael grew a lot of dendrites. Every time you learn something new. Now, science shows that the most powerful is musical instrument, can you play a musical instrument? If you can't, it's time to learn. Whether you're nine or 90, got that? I love the story of the 92-year-old man who learned to play the piano. Most people in their latter years find it hard because they're dehydrated, they're having too much coffee, they're going to bed to the, they're not exercising. Exercise has got nothing to do with age. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you don't use this body, you will lose the strength of it. Another causing growth is learning a new language. And the most powerful is memorising scripture. Now you might think I've got a gift, but I don't. I'm like a dog at a bone. Now I'm going to recite something now. It's going to take about two minutes and it took me six months. It's Proverbs 22, verse 17. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart to my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips that thy trust might be in the Lord. Have not I made known to you this day? Have not I written unto thee excellent things in counsel and in knowledge that thou might know the certainty of the words of truth? that thou might be able to give an answer to them that are sent unto thee. How long did it take me to learn that? Six months. You never give up. Most people memorise for three days and they can't remember it. That's like almost getting to the top of Mount Victoria and you're so hot and tired you're just going to walk back down. No, 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 you're nearly there. <laughs> you're nearly there. You might find it quicker, but I do a verse a week. Now there was... There, was quite, there was, wasn't as many nurse verses there to make up six months, but sometimes I'm travelling and don't quite get to it. Start memorising. It's such a fun thing to do and it's the most powerful way to develop new dendrites. Got that? My memory on names isn't great. I've been staying with Carol and Julie and for the first three days I just kept getting their names all mixed up. <laughs> So I, I'm not naturally good at memorising. It's hard work. It's just like anything you master in life. One nerve cell has the ability to develop 70,000 dendrites. Look at, the, look at the possibilities of our brain. The tragedy is most brains are underutilised. But today's the first day of the rest of your life. Today you can begin. 
shrink. If you don't use your brain cells, they die. Mercury kills them. Alcohol kills them. Lack of use kills them. And remember, they don't grow again. But in 1998, a group of scientists discovered brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a protein that stimulates new brain cells. How exciting is that? But it'll only happen if you go to bed early, if you have a low-carbohydrate, low-sugar diet, if you exercise every day, if you're fully hydrated. There are requirements. You know what another one is? Fasting. Do you know what an easy way to fast is? Have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. Sometimes paupers don't eat. Many days I fast from lunch to breakfast the next day. That's about 18 hours. That fasting stimulates brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the protein that stimulates neurogenesis, new brain cells. And isn't that the formula God gave us? So what's the good shrinking scenario? When you forgive everyone who's ever hurt you, ever misunderstood you, you turn painful past to dust. And when you turn painful past to dust, when the glial cells come along and eat up all the therns, there's nothing to draw you down there anyway, anymore. And the pathway to that bad memory actually shrinks. Isn't that good news? It need not be part of your everyday life life. How exciting is that? Some people are plagued with their past. Forgive. <laughs> Forgive. It'll turn the painful past to dust Then there's nothing to draw you down there anymore and that pathway shrinks. We never forget but it need not be part of the everyday life. The final law is the law of diversion and the law of diversion states that when something's so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. Isn't that a great law? So if something's denied you, accept it and then look for where God wants you now. What's the old saying? If God closes a door, he opens a window. Well, one Italian man said, no, nah, no, nah. in Italy we say when God closes one door, he opens two. And have you found that in your life? When I was in the rainforest, living with an alcoholic and a drug addict, the father of my children, struggling to be able to even get enough food to feed my children, I never dreamt in a million years that I would become an international speaker. Wow, what God can do to a human being. And when I left home in 1993 escaping just with my six children in the back and only the clothes on our back. I thought it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me in my life, but it was the best. <laughs> Three months later, we found out my first husband had been in criminal activities, unfortunately, touching his daughters. He went to jail. I just saw my children blossom. Do you know, you, sometimes you don't realise the heartache you're living under until you leave. <laughs> Very hard for a woman to leave her home. Very hard. One of the most difficult decisions I've made, but you know, it turned out to be the best. I think we can all testify that, that the trials in our life, not to be rocks that crush up, but stepping stones to greater things. There are two polar opposites of emotions in our brain. One is fear, one is faith. And from faith come all the positive emotions. From fear come all the negative emotions. And the Bible verse for fear is 1 Timothy 1 verse 7. And it sa God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Mm -hmm. He's not given us the fear. We can choose not to have that fear. What can we choose to have is faith. And the Bible verse for faith is Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And hope and faith are, in, are inseparable companions. Hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible, achieves the impossible. And you know how you strengthen faith? By going to earnest conflict with fear and doubt. If that fear and doubt arise, reject. 
You know, on the television, you don't like that channel, press the button, press the button. You can do that with your mind. When negative emotions come, reject, reject, reject. It's getting really difficult. Sing. <laughs> Have a cold shower. Go remember. Strengthen your bridle. Keep that under control. It is an amazing body that God has given us. And what I've shown you this morning is how you can rewire your brain. Where there's a will, there's a way. Remember, be patient with yourselves. Be kind to yourself. Forgive yourself, just as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Mm -hmm. Does he turn anyone away? No, 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 no. So don't turn yourself away. Sometimes our self is the hardest thing. But remember, he gave us the choice. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I will come in. The great God of heaven to me? Absolutely. Let me end with another beautiful section out of um, Steps to Christ, page 100. Keep your wants, your cares, your sorrows, your joys before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs on our head is not indifferent to the sorrows of his children. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear. He holds up worlds. He rules over the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. No chapter in our experience is too dark he cannot read. No perplexity too difficult that he can unravel. No sincere prayer escapes the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unmindful or takes no immediate notice. The relation that, ex that exists between God and the soul is as clear and distinct as if there was not another soul on the planet to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son to die. Oh, what precious promises are ours. And if you're interested in that little book, Steps to Christ, which is such a beautiful book, I'm sure that you can see some of the people in the church and they will have some. Do we have some Steps to Christ? I'm sure we do. Thank you for your attention. And I trust you've been inspired. I trust that you have been encouraged. And I trust that you are going to take up the cause so that your brain can get smarter and younger and wiser as you age. Do we have a song? We have a song. Let's stand to sing Amazing Grace. Let us bow our heads. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. God has done all that possibly can be done to help us. All he asks is that we will let him. So my prayer is that you will do as Matthew 5, 14 says, 
Let your light so shine before men that they, seeing your good works, will glorify your Father in heaven. When we make the decisions to change our lives, we will be a light on a hill that will touch all that are in the house. Not one soul in this room will be left by God. He's, he, his eye and his hand is on each one of us, just waiting for us to say, Father, come in. Thank you so much, Father, that we're here today. It is by no accident that each one of us are here. Thank you so much for this information on how we can better serve you and know you. I pray, Father, that you will continue to guide and keep each one of us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.